Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. It's the show that is hyped to find the Lakers' next GOAT, Matt McClung. Gives it back to McClung. Got to the mid-range, fires and ties it! If he makes it to opening night and gets an alley-oop from LeBron, he is absolutely going to be in the top 10 of fan votes for All-Star next year. All right, let's start with some hot takes. Congratulations to Team USA for winning the 2020 Olympics medal count that took place in 2021. There were tons of things to talk about, like the continued dominance of our women's basketball team, Allison Felix winning an historic 11 medals, and while debuting her own brand, Seish, Gable Stevenson dominating in wrestling and guaranteeing himself a big payday in WWE and or UFC, Snoop Dogg wondering if that horse was doing a crip walk, and of course, the men's basketball team winning gold. But maybe my favorite sneaker related moment came when Asia Wilson was clowning Damian Lillard notice Adidas athlete when he had to wear the Nike Glide fly ease for the medal ceremony. You knew I was fly yesterday. Making me burn up all my goddamn game. Like for kid, my nigga. Man. We all know how much Dame loves and appreciates the three stripes, so that was wild awkward. But, you know, props to him for being a good sport about it and not turning it into an MJ and I took it personally moment when he had to wear a Reebok track jacket in 1992. It's not that deep, yo. NBA Summer League is going on right now and we've already got two sneaker-related headlines. First, Lamella Ball debuting his signature shoe on the sidelines, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and Lakers rookie Chandy Brown blowing out his Jordan Zion 1 while trying to play pressure defense. I guess it happens to all shoes at some point. I guess it's just weird that it happened to be Zion related. Anyway, guess I'll have to throw out a whole bunch of Nike PG jokes now. Don't worry, we've got more in the tank. And uh, speaking of Summer League, it's the place where we get our first look at players who were recently drafted. You know, some they're also kids who didn't get selected fighting for a spot at training camp and some veterans hoping to get another shot in the league. And dudes who look like they're NPCs in Cyberpunk 2077, like my guy Janice Tima, a 6'8 beach blonde Latvian who was drafted by Memphis with the last pick back in 2013. No idea if he's going to make it to the league, but if he ever wants to stick around and knows how to use a kendo stick, I think we may have found the perfect guy to play a young Sandman if WWE. WWE ever gets around to doing an ECW movie. Uh, shout out to J.R. Smith, man. The two-time NBA champ and NBA Twitter legend is going back to school for the first time or something like that. I forgot how that saying goes. Anyway, Smith is enrolling in North Carolina a and to pursue a degree in liberal studies. Not only that, he's awaiting word from the NCAA if he could actually play on the school's golf team since he did go straight to the NBA out of high school back in 2004. If you didn't know, Smith is legit on the golf course and maybe has the prettiest swing in the league, which is surprisingly more competitive than you might actually think. Really just hope this leads to a tournament I can watch on the Golf Channel where JR is rocking some custom Jordan retros in Aggies colors and doing his celebration dance. Make it happen, NCAA. You finally made it to the 21st century with the NIL rulings? Let JR play. Lionel Messi is the newest member of Paris Saint-Germain after an amazing decades-long association with FC Barcelona. Never thought I'd see the day when Messi would be wearing the Jumpman, but here we are. Also, never thought I'd see the day when people would wonder aloud if Messi had jumped over the jump man when, again, Messi is going to a team where the jump man is on the team kits, but whatever. Yes, obviously Messi is a more popular athlete than Michael Jordan at this very moment, but wake me up when people are rocking Messi brand retro sneakers all over the world. Looks like Drake is beefing with Kanye Associates over the blandness of his Noctis sneakers. I know social media right now is having too much fun dunking on former Laker Dennis Schroeder for betting on himself and turning down a multi-year deal worth over $80 million from the Lakers in the hopes of cashing in this offseason, only to find no one was living in fantasy land and he ended up with a one-year $5.9 million from Boston. But yo, did you know that Victor Oladipo, former NBA All-Star and dude who released a freaky R&B album, turned down multiple deals that were worth more than what Lakers were offering Schroeder and is now signing for the veterans minimum in Miami? Yeah, yeah, injuries and whatnot, but still, lay off Dennis and dunk on Victor for a second. Okay, Dennis, now's your chance. Run, run away, and never return. Don't look back at the memes and gifts. They're terrible. Before we move on to the next segment, we here at Hard Pass want to give Gentry Humphrey his flowers. The longtime Nike and Jordan brand executive is retiring at the end of September, and he leaves behind a legacy that gave Air Jordans a more vibrant and diverse color spectrum. During MJ's playing days... It really felt like the only Jordans we could ever buy were some combination of white, black, and red. In the early 2000s, Humphrey helped introduce new colorways like the Mocha Air Jordan 3 and the Laney Air Jordan 5, and a pair we're getting later this year, the Cool Gray Air Jordan 11. 
Those would lead the way to other Gentry projects like the Defining Moments Pack and the undefeated Air Jordan 4. He moved on to Nike Sportswear and Nike Golf in the 2010s with highlights that include the Galaxy Phone Posits and adding some damn personality to Nike Golf Shoes. He would return to Jordan brand a few years later and was integral in the proliferation of the Jordan Retros popping up on golf courses everywhere these days. He had his detractors, Pro tip, don't go to Nike Talk if you're a Gentry fan, but he also enjoyed engaging with his audience, including one particular co-writer whose interview with Gentry helped launch his career into sneaker media. So thanks for everything, Gentry. But don't forget to tell someone at Sportswear to finally retro the OG White and Royal Air Penny 1 on your way out. We appreciate it. So... This past week, we got our first look at the Puma MB-01, the first signature shoe of LaMelo Ball. Okay, that's not technically true. Ball did have his signature big baller brand shoe, but that's like saying Kevin Garnett had six signature shoes with Anta. Yes, it absolutely counts in his signature shoe ledger, but when people talk about KG's signature shoes, it's going to be his Nikes and maybe his Adidas, and that's a maybe. Anyways, we've seen a number of new signature shoe lines begin over the past several years, but it's been a while since one of them truly became a hit. Big splashy arrival. Everyone talks about how awesome it is to have a signature shoe. It's a pair you can wear off the court too. They've got cool artists and brand collabs, blah, 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 blah. Promising debuts, but little follow-up afterwards. Not everything breaks through in the sneaker culture, which is, you know, fine. That's the way it should be. We might not have meritocracy in real life, but maybe we can have some semblance of it in the sneaker world. So yes, we are still in that part of the cycle where what's worn off the court gets more attention than what's worn on the court. Don't know when that pendulum will swing the other way, but it's certainly not right now or anytime soon. So it's going to take a true standout basketball shoe to start that push. And I have a feeling that the Puma MB-01 might be the catalyst for that change. Just, you know, don't call it an overnight success story for Puma. Think of it as a breakthrough for LaMelo and the culmination of Puma's comeback. For the past several years, the brand has made a number of smart moves to dig their way out of sneaker obscurity. As recently as a few years ago, Puma was virtually a non-factor in popular sneaker culture. They were not struggling or in fear of going out of business by any means, but the cool factor definitely wasn't there. And yet, here we are on the precipice of the signature shoe debut of arguably the most popular young player in the league today, and he's locked into Puma. Puma's rise back to prominence was a years-long odyssey. While they had their imprint in the worlds of soccer, motorsports, and luxury mobiles, and track and field were the Usain Bolt, they were mainly known in the U.S. for their catalog of classics like the Puma Suede or the Puma Clyde sneakers that dropped decades ago. They had a very brief one-year run with Vince Carter, but nobody really remembers that. In the early 2010s, Puma focused on changing the company's culture and their vision for the future. Then they would sign Rihanna in 2014 to be creative director of their women's business. That raised a lot of eyebrows and brought back some much-needed attention to the brand. They would sign promising young players in the NBA like DeAndre Ayton, who just played in this year's finals. Their collaborations with all sorts of intellectual properties like Sonic the Hedgehog would get people from all walks of life engaged with the brand. There's the partnership with Jay-Z that at times has felt a little like that time NBA 2K signed Hove to be an executive producer, which is to say we paid Hove a lot of money to pick cuts from the soundtrack and he may or may not have had a role in convincing Charles Barkley to return to the video game for that one measly mold. But Puma's basketball creative director has been making the right moves behind the scenes and rocking sneakers you can buy right now whenever he's on camera. It's not as flashy as the S. Carter days with Reebok, but it's ultimately more impactful in the long term. Okay, I guess the Puma private plane that Hove uses and we saw LaMelo ride to Summer League is definitely flashy. But you see what I'm saying? Jay-Z isn't front and center anymore. It's LaMelo's time. Then the RS Dreamer would launch, a signature basketball shoe backed by J. Cole as he pursued his hoop dreams. The debut of the Dreamer was a buzz-worthy moment in the sneaker world and was worn by all of the Puma NBA guys along with Cole. Of course, sneakers like the RSX, the Fenty Creeper, and more solidified Pumas came back. And now they got a potential NBA superstar with 7.1 million Instagram followers who has built up a name for himself since he was in middle school. So at Summer League, LaMelo was rocking a red colorway of the shoe, which of course is going to catch the eye of anybody watching and photographers who are looking to get that extra bump from the breaking news. There's not much to judge from the few pics that we got, but we do know that it will have his slogans, one of one and not from here and his logo on the upper. It's a far cry from his BBB signature shoe, which was admirable for a first attempt and definitely less of a botched launch when compared to Big Brother Lonzo's own release. However, it was a niche product for a very loud fan 
fan base that does their talking by tweeting and less buying and wearing the brand. Like, for all the talking fans of LeVar and BBB that you hear online, how often did you actually see people rocking BBB merch? Even though we had our fair share of jokes about the BBB, the idea of BBB, a built from the ground, black owned business that captured the imagination of the sports world, was not a joke. But it also needed better management and products. So after Lonzo left BBB in a very public way, LaMelo would soon follow. Projected to be a high lottery pick in the 2020 NBA draft, one would think that LaMelo would have been destined to step out of the shadows of Big Baller brand and into the bags of money that Nike or Adidas or Under Armour was offering. Maybe Ball could have signed with Jordan brand, which would make Michael Jordan his boss twice over. But Puma? Wow. That's the result of all of their efforts to change the brand's image. I'm not so sure LaMelo signs with Puma without Rihanna, without Cole, without Hove, and without a foundation of young talent in the league already. And after a season where he became a league pass favorite and the eventual rookie of the year, he lived up to his end of the deal. Now, the MB01 has to deliver. I'm going to need to see the shoe in a colorway that's not just all red because if there's one thing I've learned, it's that red overwhelms everything and you're talking less about the shoe and its design and more about the novelty of it being all red. Case in point, red October Yeezys. But those same voices who were supporting LeVar, Lonzo, LiAngelo, and LaMelo during the BBB days are finally going to actually back it up with buying LaMelo Puma merch and sneakers. At least, that's what the hope is. What do you think about the Puma MB01 and the future of LaMelo Ball as a signature shoe athlete? Let me know down in the comments below. I'm really interested to hear you guys' perspective. All right, it's the Heat Check, where we bring you everything that's actually dropping this week. So let's start with kicks we featured here already, and they actually got delayed. But you can guess which ones I'm talking about. The Bad Bunny Adidas Forum Low Buckle Core Black, August 17th for 160. The Women's Nike Dunk Low Purple Pulse on the 18th for 110. The Women's Nike Dunk Low Yellow Strike on the 18th for 110. The Aura Lee New Balance 550 on August 19th for 180. And then we have the Nike Dunk Low Black Camel on August 18th for 110. I'll be surprised if this actually releases on schedule. Let's just be honest here. The Alila May Women's Air Jordan 14 Fortune on the 19th for 190. Alila May's half black and half Filipino roots are on display with her latest collaboration with Jordan Brand. The suede upper is highlighted by a shank plate and outsole that is colored in jade and cold, referencing a bracelet that May received from her Lola. Nike Kyrie 7, One World, One People on the 20th for 130. The next colorway of the Kyrie Andrew Irving signature shoe is a yellow version of the One World, One People theme. Adorned in peaceful imagery and colored with upbeat tones, the shoe speaks to the KIL's chill vibe, which will hopefully continue and rise above whatever issues he might have with Nike at the moment. We have the Air Jordan 12 Utility on the 21st for 190. The easiest thing to do when you hear that the Nike outsole uses 3% grind, which is comprised of recycled materials, is to be a sarcastic jerk about it and give a golf clap like, wow, 3%. But I want to look at this as a positive, like better late than never. And in light of current news, we can push Nike and other brands to go even further. Look, Space Hippie Jordans are not something I would be opposed to seeing. Then my pick of the week is the Air Jordan 36 Violet on the 19th. We've seen the Air Jordan 36 for a few months now. and It's finally getting a proper release at retail. Worn by NBA and WNBA stars, this will be the lightest game shoe Jordan brand has produced since the Air Jordan 29, which should get the attention of hoopers out there since the 29 is still highly regarded to this day. And now for a heat check on... What If, the latest MCU project on Disney+. Plus. After the revelations of WandaVision, the sentimentality of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and the mindfuck of Loki, What If swoops in at the right time to ask the questions we've always wondered in our nerd brains. After the Loki show established that alternate timelines and the multiverse are now in play, this new animated show explores those possibilities. In the trailers for the show, we got the T'Challa as Star-Lord, Marvel Zombies, Howard the Duck maybe actually doing something, and as we find out in the first episode, Agent Carter becoming the first Avenger. Those are all interesting premises. For those who haven't read the comic books, what if allowed Marvel to get weird with their characters? Introducing scenarios that would almost certainly never happen in the proper universe, and some that are just slight alterations that highlight how much or how little a character could change because of those tweaks. Some of those classic stories include Spider-Man marrying Gwen Stacy, Wolverine killing the Hulk, and one that is really relevant today, a 1984 story about a Captain America who's revived in modern times to find an America that has elements of the nonsense we're dealing with today. Anyways, after watching the first episode, without getting into specific spoilers, my excitement for the show has 
has dampened just a bit. Of course, it makes sense to debut the show with a fan favorite character like Agent Carter. She was such a scene stiller that she even got her own spinoff show on network television in one of the MCU's first attempts to break into TV. The problem is that Marvel tried to do too much in the premiere episode's 30 minutes. Instead of going on an entirely new tangent that focuses on Carter and is so far removed from the sacred MCU timeline, they counterbalance it with rehashes of the first Avenger movie with characters just switching roles. The new and unexplored branches of the timeline are more of what I want, while the remixes of the movies I couldn't care less about. Doing both in 30 minutes is a lot to ask, and I'm not sure that the show is capable of doing both as we get deeper into the series. It feels like a video game with branching narratives like Mass Effect or Telltale's Walking Dead. Yes, you make choices that feel literally game-changing at the moment, but really, it's merely a diversion and you eventually make your way back to the story the writers always wanted to tell. I don't want that. I want weird. The trailer also hinted at a possible team-up between Carter and Doctor Strange, and that's something we've never seen before, so maybe my fears will ultimately be unfounded, but for right now, while I love the idea of Agent Carter becoming the first Avenger, I don't particularly care for her just becoming the second Steve Rogers, if that makes sense. I give the first episode of What If Five Dances to Old Timey Music out of 10 times I resisted calling Captain Carter, Captain Britain. Okay, here's the top five what if ideas that will never happen. Five, what if Star-Lord wasn't an idiot and kept this cool for 15 seconds so they could get the gauntlet off of Thanos? Number four, what if Black Widow just did the right thing and sacrificed Hawkeye for the Soul Stone because seriously, Hawkeye did some bad <laughs> during the blip. And number three, what if Peter Parker liked Liz so much he teamed up with Vulture? Number two, what if they never cut the Ghostface cameo in Iron Man 1? And number one, what if Luis became Atman? Bonus. Screw it, what if T.I. became Ant-Man? It's time for this week's Hard Pass where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go, like dying for this There was a shooting this past week at the Shoe Palace on Melrose here in Los Angeles that left one employee, 26-year-old Jaron Bradford, dead. According to KTLA 5 and ABC 7, Bradford was just arriving at the store to start his shift when an argument among customers began over a raffle for a pair of sneakers that was supposed to release this week. Bradford was trying to intervene and de-escalate things when the group that was arguing turned their focus on him. As Bradford was backing up, someone in the group shot at him in the crosswalk. Bradford was pronounced dead by the time he arrived at the hospital. When talking to reporters about Bradford, co-worker Keyshawn Williams had this to say about him. He always made me feel welcome and like this was somewhere that you wanted to be. He said he was just a good guy. He was an outgoing peer who always wanted to make friends. A stylist who was at the store the week prior said that Bradford was very helpful in getting her the shoes that she needed for a client. And friend of the program, Brandon, said on Twitter that Jaren was a young man who left a great impression on people he came in contact with. As of this recording, the suspect has been arrested. But before we move on here at Hard Pass, I want to pass along our thoughts and prayers out to Jaren's family and friends and to everybody who was personally affected by this tragedy. Look, I know this sounds trite at a time like this, but I think it bears repeating. No sneaker, no matter how hyped or how much money it can get you, is worth a single life. All of the sneaker blogs, all of the Instagram accounts, all of the resellers can tell you that this sneaker or that sneaker can make you cool or rich or famous and it doesn't matter. None of it is worth carrying a gun to a store during a stupid raffle and it's certainly not worth shooting someone who is just trying to maintain peace. The person who shot Bradford made a choice and it's a choice that we've been dealing with for far too long, man. You can say that in-store raffles did this or that stores don't do enough to protect their customers. I get that. I understand the frustration. Hopefully, this is a wake-up call for businesses to do better in the future to protect their customers and employees. And whatever the big brands can do to help things will also be welcome. But again, this is not a new thing. It keeps happening. And for what? A $100 come up? Actually, it's typically less than that. And it's pathetic. Every few months, we see videos circulating of people getting into fights at the mall over general release retros. Sometimes you'll see stores asking their customers to do stupid stunts like they're subhuman in order to have the opportunity to take their money. And then there are the tragic instances like what happened to Jaren. It's been going on since way before the in-store raffles and the sneaker apps. Back in the 2000s, you had police escorting kids who bought Pigeon SB Dunks to their cars just so they could feel safe. There was hysteria over the phone posits in the early 2000s and the early aughts that forced some stores to delay releases. In the 90s, you had the infamous Sports Illustrated cover story that featured the Air Jordan 5 and the headline, Your Sneakers or Your Life. Back then, 
you couldn't blame limited edition or bots or resale value. It wasn't about the sneakers, but rather the, the status you could claim by having the sneakers or the nice jacket or whatever the next thing is that you thought could make you appear cool. The reasons change, but the violence doesn't. We need to be better, all of us. This is a group effort. Yes, we can make the jokes and have the arguments and critique the multi-billion dollar corporations that make these shoes that we covet so much. When I look at iPhone launches and how I don't hear stories about people acting up despite having lines that stretch around the block at their flagship stores, I wonder how we can apply that to the sneaker world. At the same time, when I read up on Target and Walmart refusing to stock PlayStation 5 and Xboxes in store in order to protect their employees, I see that the problem isn't just with sneakers. It's with the value that we place on these items and how we let them control our lives. When really, they're just things to have. If you can't get them, just move on and wait for the next thing. You're still without a PS5? Who f***ing cares? Those things will eventually catch up to the demand and when you do get one, you'll be able to buy those games you wanted for cheaper than if you had bought them now. Who's the sucker then? You missed out on Air Jordan 11 Concords? Big deal, there's the breads the following year. You struck out on those two? So what, the cool grades are coming this year. Like, sneakers never stop, man. You should never be in a position where you are dwelling on the pair you missed out on, not when there's something just as cool or even cooler down the pipeline. Let's not keep finding new reasons to get fired up and do something dumb for shoes. Let's not use the life of Jaron Bradford as a moment to get on your soapbox and promote an agenda that barely even relates to the situation. And let's not have this kind of headline happen ever again. All right, that's gonna do it for the show. Uh, thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I'm Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week. Peace.